So up until now, we've talked about phenomena involving light that could be explained by either light being a particle or light being a wave. But now we're going to discuss a phenomenon that can only be explained if light is a wave, and that is interference. Now interference is not a phenomenon that's easily observable in everyday life around us, and the reason for that is that most light sources that we have uh, around us in a room are incoherent sources. In other words, the phase of the light coming from that source is not fixed. It randomly changes over time, and so you do not, it is hard to observe interference phenomena under those conditions. But there is one phenomenon that's due to interference that we can observe even with incoherent light sources, and that's the interference that occurs on a thin film of material. So the best example of that is, in fact, when you have a thin film of soap, such as a soap bubble, and you get light that's reflected from the top surface and the bottom surface of this thin film. So to see what's going on there, let's have a look at a diagram and explain why we get all these many different colors with a thin film of soap. So the first thing we have to discuss when considering interference in thin films is what happens when light reflects off the surface of some material. So let's say, for example, we've got some material here um, and we've got some light that is incident on this material and it is going to reflect off back in the opposite direction uh, to the angle of incidence. And we're assuming it's 90 degrees for the angle of incidence. Now the situation there with light is almost exactly the same as the situation here where if we consider we've got a thin string and then it's connected to a uh, large heavier string. So here we have a low mass per unit length, and here we have a high mass per unit length. And if I send some wave pulse along this string, what will happen at this boundary is some of the wave pulse will be reflected and some of the wave pulse will carry on. And that's exactly what will happen with light when it hits the surface of a glass block. For example, some of it will be transmitted and some of it will be reflected. But if this is a heavier piece of string here, the reflected wave has the opposite sign. So this is now the reflected wave going back. But because this string here is harder to move than the light string on this side, the reflected wave has a f opposite phase, right? The transmitted wave always carries on with the same phase, but here the reflected wave will have an opposite phase because this boundary is a little bit like, not exactly the same obviously, but it's a little bit like a clamped end of the string. Now obviously with a clamped end of this string the entire wave would have to be reflected. Here it's only sort of, it, there's an additional resistance due to the higher mass per unit length of the heavy string, so it gets reflected with the opposite phase. And this is what is going to happen with light if we have a refractive index here of N1 and a refractive index here of N2. If N2 is bigger than N1, then we have this situation here. So if we had a light pulse that looked like this, the reflected light pulse would have an inverted phase. And so we have this condition that we have a phase inversion, and a phase inversion, remember, is the uh, change in phase is equal to pi. And we have this phase inversion for light when it reflects off the surface of a medium which has a higher refractive index. Now, of course, we can also look at the opposite situation. So again, here's our medium here's our light wave that's going to come in and it's going to reflect off and head back the other way and we've got n1 and we've got n2 here but this time we're going to have n1 is greater than n2 and if we compare this to our, our string analogy this is the case where we have we start with the wave going along our large string so that's a rather badly drawn wave pulse connects to our thin string and we are going to get a reflection, a partial reflection even here, right? So we're going to get the wave pulse transmitted, um, and that will happen just like it happened for the uh, uh, other case. But now our reflected wave here 
is going to have the same sign. And that's because this end is actually, e this string here is easier to move than the heavy string, and so it acts a little bit, not obviously exactly the same, but it's a little bit like the open end of a string, where when we get a reflection, we get a reflection with the same sign. And it's no surprise that this is exactly what happens here for light. We have the wave pulse coming in. When it reflects, we're going to get the same sign of a wave coming back. So the reflected wave here for light will have no phase change at all. So delta phi is equal to zero. So delta phi is zero if the incident if the medium that we're in has a higher refractive index than the medium uh, whose boundary we're reflecting off we have a phase change of pi if the opposite is true and the medium that we're traveling through has a lower refractive index than the surface of the medium we're reflecting off and obviously in both these cases there is also going to be a transmitted component that carries straight on so now we know how the phase of light changes when it reflects off a boundary between two media. So here's the situation we want to look at. We've got a ray of light reflecting off uh, a soap bubble, and we have it reflecting off the top surface here. This, remember, is air, so the refractive index is uh, roughly 1. Here we've got the soap bubble, so the refractive index is greater than 1, or in fact generally for any film, um, no matter whether it's glass, or soap, water, whatever, you're going to have a refractive index greater than 1. And then here again we have n is approximately equal to 1. So in this situation, this reflected light has a phase change of pi. It has an inverted phase because we've got a low refractive index and we're reflecting off the surface of a high refractive index medium. Here, though, we're in a high refractive index medium and we're reflecting off the surface of a low refractive index medium, the air again, and so we end up with no phase change here. Now, to show you what's really going on, right, what's actually happening is the light is coming vertically in here, it's being transmitted through, and then it comes vertically out here. But some of it is reflected at this point and goes back, and some of it at this point is reflected as well and goes back. And so these two rays of light are going to add together to give us the interference effects. Now, this, of course, is incoherent light. So... The reason we are, this is the reason we're you looking at a thin film, because even in coherent light, the phase of the light cannot change instantly. And so you have what's called a, an inco a coherence length of the light, and that measures how rapidly the phase of the light is changing. And if this thin film is thin enough, then the light will r have roughly the same phase, um, even though uh, you know, uh, the, the light will have roughly the same phase over the time it takes for the light to come here and reflect back, so that this ray and this ray will both have the same initial phase. In other words, the light isn't going to change phase um, over the time that it takes for the, for the beam of light to go here and here, which is why you see these effects in thin films like soap, but not in slightly thicker films like the glass for example in a window or in your spectacles or, or you know thicker pieces of, of transparent material like that. So what we want to do is we want to calculate the phase difference between uh, this wave here and the uh, this green phase here the green wave here with the inverted phase and the red uh, reflected ray here. So if we remember back to our expression for a wave, we have cosine A times the cosine of Kx minus omega t, and I'm ignoring the phase constant here because that's not relevant. And so we can see that the um, phase difference between these two rays doesn't just come from this reflection phase difference. It also comes from the fact that the red ray has traveled all the way down here and all the way back up to here before it gets added to this uh, green ray here. So remember, of course, everything's actually happening vertically. So the distance here is just two times the thickness of the film, which we've called H. So this is going to alter the phase due to this k times x term here. And so what we're going to get for this phase difference is we're going to get uh, k, oops, k times 
two times the thickness of the film because the ray goes down and then it comes back again. So that gives us our phase difference because of the distance traveled. But we also have this phase inversion here because this ray now has an additional phase of, of change of pi. So we've got, we can subtract the uh, pi here that this ray gets. This ray gets 2k times 2h. This ray just gets a phase difference of pi. And this is our phase difference between the two rays. Now we can ask we are if when we get uh, when are we going to get destructive interference in other words uh, for what thicknesses of film will we actually see no reflected light well that's going to be the case when our phase change here is equal to an odd number of pi right that will give us a zero reflection and if we want a very strong reflection, then we want these two rays to add coherently. And this will require that we have a phase change of an even number of pi. And that will give us um, a maximum reflection, because then we get constructive interference between these two reflected rays. So let's uh, work out the conditions for zero reflection and maximum reflection. So here's our condition for no reflection from the thin film and the two rays are cancelling out. And what we're going to do is we'll expand this out. So 2h times k becomes uh, 4 pi times h over lambda, because k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, minus pi is equal to 2n minus 1 um, in brackets times pi. So we can cancel pi uh, everywhere and then we're left with 4h over lambda minus 1 is equal to 2n minus 1. So we can cancel the uh, minus 1s. And then we're left with the fact that um, we get perfect cancellation. We can cancel this uh, 4 with a 2 and cancel that here. And so we get that um, essentially the thickness is equal to n lambda over 2 will give us perfect cancellation. So if we have a thickness um, that is a, a half fractional uh, number of wavelengths, then we will end up with perfect cancellation and no reflected light at all. Or alternatively, of course, we can always rewrite this, that the wavelength is going to be equal to two times the thickness divided by our integer n, um, depending on whether you want to be varying the thickness or you want to find out which wavelengths we get a cancellation in reflection for given a particular thickness. Now, we can also look at the case of maximum reflection. So here we have the condition for maximum reflection. And again, when we expand this out, we're going to have 4h times pi over lambda minus pi is equal to 2n times pi. And we can cancel through the pi's. Um, and now what we're going to end up with is that we're going to end up with 4h over lambda is equal to 2n plus 1. And so, again, depending on whether we want to express it in terms of the thickness or the wavelength, we can write that we get constructive interference when the thickness is equal to 2n plus 1 times lambda divided by 4. However, of course, n in this case could be 0. Usually the convention is, so this is for n equals 0, 1, and so on, right? Usually the convention is we use n equals to 1, Two and so on. And so if we use that convention, then it's 2n minus 1 times lambda over 4. And I haven't done anything dodgy there other than just uh, redefine n as going from 1 instead of going from 0. But both are equally valid expressions just as, use, as long as you use the right range of n values. Now, it's worth pointing out at this point, so this is, we've got our conditions for thicknesses in terms of wavelength. So whether we get a, a reflection or not will depend on the wavelength and the thickness. And so if you shine white light on this uh, film 
only certain wavelengths will be reflected and that's where the colors come from in a soap bubble um, because the certain wavelengths will cancel out and other wavelengths will not because the cancellation or not lack of cancellation depends on the wavelength versus the uh, thickness here h the other thing to note is that this is the case when we have the top one gets inverted so this is you know one of the rays gets a, an inversion from um, the uh, surface so this one had a phase change of pi and this one had a phase change of zero so we had a net phase difference of pi because of the reflection however if you have something where you have an increasing refractive index so n1 n2 and n3 and so n1 is greater than n2 is greater than n3 then this wave will get a phase change reflected of pi this wave will also get a phase change reflection of pi because it's n2 is less than n3 and so in this case the conditions are reversed and this becomes the condition for zero reflection and the condition we looked at before for uh, no reflection becomes the condition for maximum reflection and that's explained um, if you want to do that you can you can actually generate a little table of whether you have a phase change of pi between the reflected rays or whether there is no phase change between them and the same is true if we had this reversed if n3 was less than n2 was less than n1 then we'd have zero phase change for the reflection here and zero phase change for the reflection here and this this case would be the same as both of them having pi so be careful and remember that if there is a phase um, whether or not one or both of them have a phase change of pi can change these conditions so what you need to learn here is the method rather than just quoting the answers because the answer whether it's maximum or minimum reflection will depend on the phase change that occurs at the boundary so let's have a look at this in action so here we have a thin film forming a soap bubble and hopefully you can see the different colors in it I don't know how long it's going to last it's going to pop and this is from interference of light reflected from the top surface and the inner surface of the bubble and different wavelengths cancel depending on the thickness of the film and you can get quite vivid colors I'm seeing yellow on the top, blues, a, a few greens, even some violets at points the thickness of the bubble is not uniform so the color is not uniform also you're seeing it at different angles and the angle at which you view it matters so clearly here what we're seeing is interference uh, is an interference effect from the reflected light from both surfaces of the bubble so now we've seen how interference in thin films can generate a whole variety of colors and the camera didn't catch all of them perfectly they were a lot more vivid um, when you were looking at the soap bubble uh, in person but nevertheless you could see it if you look closely at the uh, video so that shows that light is a wave. We get interference and certain wavelengths cancel out, leaving the remaining wavelengths to give you a color. Now, while soap bubbles are fun and entertaining, there is actually a more practical use to this. And this involves a phenomenon that Newton himself discovered that's called Newton rings. And that is what we will look at in the next video.